Con is really meant to, to explain the test uh, a little bit uh, to go over some values. There's about uh, 25 or so people who have had test results, uh, some of whom were not on the original telecon, so I'm, I'm going to go over those results quickly for everybody who, who did the test. Um, I should mention a couple things to the housekeeping details. Um, you all received some special links, uh, sort of celebration. Uh, it's, it's great for me to be able to, to reach out and speak with you folks, and, and uh, I appreciate your time, as I said. So what we did was we, uh, we took the primary featured product, uh, the Ultra 85 and the Ideal Omega Test, and we brought the price down to what they were. Uh, for a very brief time in May of this year when I was uh, speaking at uh, David Wolf's wonderful Longevity Now conference where I had the great pleasure of meeting some of you face-to-face. -face. Uh, so we we brought everything back to that level. A um, couple of other housekeeping details. Um, the actual ideal omega test. We only have 25 of those tests and there's a lot more people than that on this call. So if you are interested in doing the test, or you become interested during this broadcast, please act quickly because it's highly unlikely that we're going to order any more of them for the simple reason that the uh, U.S. government has decided that since this is a blood spot test, a test that requires you to stick your finger, um, they are going to regulate it now and uh, force you to go through your own doctor instead of doing it as a home test, which is how it has been for the past five or six years. So the laws have changed. Now, someone asked, why did this happen, and was complaining that it's a BS law. I agree with you. I mean, you can do your blood sugar without uh, having to uh, go through all of that. But uh, again, the government sees fit to regulate a lot of things. And uh, I don't have a problem. Uh, I think in the sense that you, you should involve your physician in all decisions. My biggest problem is most of your doctors out there don't know anything about omega-3s. And I can tell you that because I read the blogs and I read the comments especially on this uh, recent uh, prostate cancer debacle uh, that came out uh, last month. And I read what the doctors are saying, and it, clearly they're extremely uninformed. Um, so you folks are going to go out of here more informed than most of the physicians because we are going to attack some facts and fictions, and we're also going to cover some questions that just never seem to go away. They come up over and over again. Um, so there is some um, hardcore science that we're going to cover tonight. Uh, it's going to be as painless as I can possibly make it. Um, Patrick, why don't you move to the next slide just so we can see the links up there. Now, these I don't, I don't believe these links are actually clickable on the screen as those of you who are using your computer. Um, but just to remind you, the deadline is September 1st. If you get your test in before September 1st, it can be done without uh, your personal physician's prescription. If you wait till after that, uh, you have to con your physician into giving you a script for it, and then you probably have to go visit them and go over the test results, which I guarantee you 99% of them aren't going to know what to do with, and they're just going to read it off the sheet just the way you would. Um, and there's going to be a fee, their fee, for spending time with you attached to that. It's a shame. There's nothing I can do about it. Um, also, uh, there is a YouTube test link there um, at the bottom that shows you how to do the test. Uh, and walks you through some tips. Um, so if you have questions, uh, we had a volunteer uh, do that on camera, um, and you'll see it's very, very easy to do and very simple to do. Um, and I go through some things about why you may have some minor difficulties if you have difficulties at all. And most of it has to do with the fact that a lot of people who do the test are abysmally low on omega-3s and abysmally high on omega-6s. And so their blood clots very quickly, and they don't understand why they can't get blood out. Um, the individual who did that test is actually on the telecon tonight, and we got her result back. And she has an 80% omega-3 level, which is the highest I've seen in recent uh, uh, times. Um, it's probably right about as high as it should be. It shouldn't go any higher than that. So you'll see that she was actually the perfect person. We didn't do that intentionally. It just kind of happened that way. So uh, let's move on to the next slide. And as I promised you, there are some issues we have to discuss. Um, and a, a little bit of disclaimer here. Those of you who know me and have met me in person know that I'm a um, pretty genuine person, that I don't uh, pull a whole lot of punches, that I say things as they are. I have made plenty of enemies uh, because of that, because um, I don't always agree with what the party line is, especially when it comes to supplements and supplementation. But that said, I want to remind you that I do make supplements. I have made supplements for the past 12 years of my life, and I sell supplements. And those supplements 
um, that I sell uh, fund a significant amount of the research that I do on other supplements. And those of you who read The Immortality Edge and who are planning on reading my next book, which should be out in about a year, on telomeres, uh, as well as another book we're working on, which is more of a makeover book, um, your patronage, if you will, the things that you do for me, the fact that you have faith in me, the fact that you have faith in my product, allows me to bring more of these anti-aging products to the market. So I am a marketer, I am a physician, I do sell things as part of how I make my living. And that's a disclaimer, you should understand that. It's very, very hard for me to be unbiased about the products that I make and sell because I believe in them 100% myself. and I've been taking them for 12 years and some pretty phenomenal things have happened to me and to the people that I take care of. So the first question is, will the real fish oil please stand up? Um, only recently, I would say within the past year to year and a half, has there been an assault, if you will, on different types of, of fish oils and an attempt to claim uh, naturalness versus unnaturalness. And uh, it's interesting to note where this comes from. I make something called an ethyl ester uh, fish oil. And uh, recently, these have been uh, coined as short chain fish oils. Uh, that's actually not true. They're not short chain fish oils. They're exactly the same number of carbons that regular fish oil is. They're just in a different format. Um, but the reason they have come under attack lately is because the marketing aspect, uh, the people who sell other products have recognized that they can use this as a ploy to say, hey, this doesn't exist in nature. This is a man-made product and therefore it's bad. Um, and that's unfortunately for them not true. Uh, ethyl esters of these omega-3s which are EPA and DHA. Those are the two bioactive constituents of fish oil. Most everything else is non-bioactive and gets used for calories. EPA and DHA are the only things that matter. That's been proven again and again and again. The intermediates like DPA don't matter. Uh, the things leading up to them really don't matter. People have talked about parent oils such as linoleic acid and linolenic acid or ALA which comes from flaxseed and plants. Um, there's a lot of data that shows these are inferior in terms of delivering health benefits. Um, so let's let's discuss the the ethyl ester and whether or not it is uh, a natural or non-natural product. If you look for ethyl esters in fish, you won't find them. What you'll find is triglyceride. And what a triglyceride is, and I'll show you a picture of this, is it's three fat chains attached to a glycerol molecule. That's how most fat is in um, storage form in fish and in actually in people. Um, what is left out of the discussion is the intermediates that happen in human beings that don't happen in uh, marine life uh, or other mammals to some extent. The ethyl ester is an intermediate that occurs readily and easily in human beings. There's an entire enzyme system dedicated to ethyl esters and processing them to and from triglycerides and phospholipids. So essentially what these different things are the all-natural triglyceride fish oil, the ethyl ester fish oil, and the phospholipids such as krill and calamari and green lip mussel oil and those kinds of things. These are all um, things that do exist in the human body and they exist in different places and different forms and they perform different functions. The phospholipid form or the krill form if you will is primarily the membrane bound form. It tends to be inert. It tends not to be particularly active. It tends to be a storage form in membranes. Whether you take a phospholipid or a triglyceride or an ethyl ester fish oil, um, a large portion of it will ultimately go into the membrane of the cell, the membrane of the mitochondria, which is a subcellular organelle, the membrane of the nucleus, which is where your DNA, all membranes in the body have this lipid bilayer and that is the sort of krill form or phospholipid form. Um, but again, the, the, the uh, degree to which or the necessity uh, of, of taking a special form to have that happen is nonsense. Um, the body can readily convert. It knows exactly what to do with all these forms. So then you should say, well, what's the difference then, okay? Um, the difference comes into the bioactivity, and we're going to get into that in just a minute. Um, let's just hold on this slide for a second. What I want to show those of you who are on the computer can see this. Uh, actually, Patrick, can you go back one, please? Uh, back to the original um, uh, slide, please. Thank you. Will the real fish roll please stand up? So 
what you pull out of fish is a triglyceride. If you go through this little diagram here, you'll see things like TG plus EE, that's triglyceride plus ethyl esters. And then you'll see EE, that's ethyl esters. You'll see some areas where that's by itself. And then you'll see phospholipids, and you'll see some areas where that's by itself. And at the bottom, clinical status, the very bottom of the slide, it says clinical status, biomarkers, targets, and clinical outcomes. It's a function of triglycerides, ethyl esters, and phospholipids. So all these formats of omega-3s are valid, OK? And they're all natural to the human body. It's important for you to understand that. So the next time you hear somebody say, well, an ethyl ester is uh, is a man-made poison, you'll understand that they're either misinformed or flat out lying. The next time you hear somebody say that uh, phospholipid is uh, a better format for you, you should ask them, well, what happens to those phospholipids? And now let's go to the next slide so we can take a, a look at the difference. And I know this is complicated, and I appreciate your patience with this, but it's important for you folks to see this because I want you to understand um, that when you look at the realities, and in this case, the reality is science, when you look at the science and the reality behind this, most of these, all these arguments hold absolutely no water as far as superior format. There is a reason why I think ethyl esters are superior to the other formats, and I'll get to that in, in a little bit. But first and foremost, let's concentrate on what actually works in the body. This particular slide entitled, What's the Difference, starts on the top left with something called EPA. That's eicosapentaenoic acid. And those of you who have looked on the label of your fish world have seen EPA. It's one of the two essential fatty acids. The one below it is DHA. That's the other essential fatty acid. Essential meaning you cannot get them anywhere except through your diet. Your body cannot synthesize these. And what that means is there's a constant turnover of this in your body. It gets utilized. It gets broken down. It gets, yes, oxidized. And we're going to address that question later. But it gets replaced, and it gets replaced by your diet. So the two that you're looking at there, EPA and DHA, are the actual uh, form of the molecule. Now, one of the things I have to point out is that the way these are stretched, sort of um, left to right, um, it's a little misleading because on the far right of this, uh, what you're seeing is the ethyl ester fish oil. It's got an O sticking up and an O there, and it looks like it might be a little different. If you just pulled the end of that ethyl ester and straightened it out the way it is straightened out in those EPAs and DHAs, you would see it's incredibly close biochemically. Now, what happens to EPA and DHA and ethyl ester, by the way? They get changed into things. The things that get changed into are bioactive compounds. And this is where the rubber hits the road. This is where inflammation is controlled in the body. This is where, to some degree, membrane fluidity is controlled. This is where the hormone-like activities of fish oil happen. This is where the precursor activity. Things happen to those molecules. Things get added and subtracted. And the one that you see there, resolve in D1, was the first one that was um, um, discovered. And resolve in D1 has, a, a, it's called that because it resolves inflammation. It blunts inflammation. Um, several resolvents, I believe there are six of them now that have been discovered, they're all related to EPA and DHA. And what I want you to do is to look at the chemical formats or the structure. D don't even try to figure out all this stuff. Just look at the line drawings, and you'll see that they start at one end and they end at the other, and they're one long chain. Okay. That is the similarity between all these things. And again, the thing on the right that uh, apparently isn't labeled is an ethyl ester. And it could be EPA or DHA, depending on which one. This one is actually EPA, ethyl ester. But uh, you can see it's a single chain. It starts at one end and goes to the other. And what the body does when it needs to do something with the fish oil, other than store it in a membrane, is it makes a resolvin or a protectin or one of these compounds at the bottom left. Okay, And once again, the take-home point is they start at one end, they end at another, and they're one single chain. Now, Patrick, if you could put the next slide up, please. When people talk about natural triglyceride form and phospholipid, this is what they're talking about. On the left is a triglyceride, and you can see that is very different than what we just looked at. It doesn't start and stop with one long chain. It gets attached. There's actually three long chains, and then that thing at the very beginning there that's got all the H's and C's on the far left, that's a glycerol molecule. And so that makes this a triglyceride, three fat chains. 
and one glycerol molecule. Now the problem with natural triglyceride fish oil is only one of those chains is either, and I mean either, EPA or DHA. The rest is some other fat. It could be an omega-6 fat. It could be a shorter chain omega-3. It could be uh, some other form of fat that is attached on there that is used for calorie values. And what this boils down to is that a triglyceride fish oil or natural triglyceride fish oil can only ever achieve a maximum potency of 33%. It cannot get more than 33% EPA or DHA bioactive fish oil compounds out of a natural product that is untouched and unprocessed and uncleaned unless you do something to it. And in the process of doing something to it, you turn it into an ethyl ester, which is what we just looked at. Now the other thing you should know about the triglycerides is on these other fat things, these long chains that are not necessarily EPA or DHA, is where pollutants live. So you can only achieve the kind of cleanliness in this product that depends completely on the water that it comes from. Now there's a lot of differences in the cleanliness of the water in the world. Uh, there's a lot of cleanliness issues with different oceans, with different farms, whatever. But the bottom line is, unless you do something to clean this up, which inherently changes its chemical form into an ethyl ester, you will carry all those pollutants and toxins with you. And I'll show you that later in some assays that we did on some shelf and store-bought and a very famous natural triglyceride brand that was uh, trying to beat us up. On the right, you see phospholipid. This is the krill form. It has two long chains and a phosphate group. And this uh, is kind of how it lives in the membrane. Once again, if you do something to clean this up, you change its structure into an ethyl ester, and you remove any marketing hook that the krill or calamarine or mussel people could possibly have because they'd be selling an ethyl ester just as well. Now, why would you do this? Why would you want to clean something up like that? Why would you want to make it concentrated? Well, I just answered my own question. Patrick, can you go to the next slide? Okay. And this is a, um, a mass spectrometry. Uh, this is the kind of stuff we do uh, on every batch. And what you see here on top, it says fish oil ethyl ester. And on the bottom, that's fish oil triglycerides. Now, the colors are unimportant here. But you can see the fish oil ethyl ester has some little red blobs and a lot of black and some white. That's just there to differentiate it. If you look down at the regular fish oil, that would be a triglyceride fish oil, you'll see it has one of those on it. So it's carrying one chain of either EPA or DHA. The other two chains are God knows what. Now somebody asked me, what else is in fish oil besides EPA and uh, DHA? Uh, our Ultra 85 is 85 to 92 percent. People wanted to know what else is in there. Well, um, this mass spectroscopy actually shows you that. Uh, so let's Take a look at fish oil ethyl ester, and let's go left to right from the picture. Fish oil ethyl ester, you'll see 17.00, it says internal standard. That's just a measurement. You'll see a bunch of tiny, almost immeasurable other blips. Then you'll see a big blip, 49% EPA, and another big blip, 39% uh, DHA. Now, if you do the math on that, that, uh, that leaves you with a couple percent left, and that's those little blips down there. And you could pick any one of the things that are below it. So let's go below it to regular fish oil. And you see lots of spikes, lots of blips. Those are all the non-EPA, non-DHA uh, components of fish oil. And you'll notice some of them are 18 carbons, some of them are 20, some of them are 22. None of them, except the ones that spike there uh, in the EPA and the DHA, uh, which in this case is 18 and 10%. So this is a natural triglyceride fish oil that achieves a potency of about 28%, the sum of 18 and 10. And that's all that's working in your body. All the stuff to the left of that 18% is your body is going to use that for food. So I don't think that's very useful because we live in a society that is extremely omega-6 rich, that's inflamed, and omega-3 poor. And so to make it as easy as possible, uh, we've concentrated and continue to improve the concentration of the fish oil, so it's now in the 85 to 92 percent range. So you're getting as much as we can possibly physically give you. Uh, you're also getting no measurable toxins or pollutants. So that's the, the main benefit. The other benefits are that I can cite a ton of studies 
Uh, some of them uh, I've mentioned in my emails before. The big ones are what are called GC, G-I-S-S-I. Um, these were done in the late 90s when the pharmaceutical industry was trying to figure out what to do with fish oil. And they actually pioneered, I, I hate to admit it, but they were right, they pioneered the use of ethyl ester fish oil for the very same reasons, because they can concentrate it and because they can clean it and get rid of all the crap that's in it. And so there's a huge volume of human data with clinical outcomes, which I will show you uh, shortly, that are based on ethyl ester fish oils, not triglycerides, not krill. And the bottom line is they don't have that data. It doesn't exist. And they're never going to have that data because they're going to have to sell a lot more, uh, you know, uh, natural triglyceride or krill fish oil to be able to afford it. These are expensive studies. Um, so uh, th there are reasons why I chose what I chose. There are other reasons. I've gone into those in the presentation. But the main thing is there's a ton of human clinical data. Uh, you can clean it up and you can concentrate it. Uh, and once again, I think I proved my point that this does exist in the human body, so it's not uh, it's not something that you know is Franken fish oil or something like that. Next slide, uh, Patrick, which is the same slide you saw before. Um, what I want to stress is that there are many many places that fish oil works. It works in this. Uh, if you look at this box, you'll see a membrane complex. So it's in the membranes. It adds fluidity to the membranes. Um, someone asked about insulin sensitivity in the questions. And part of the answer to that is membrane fluidity. And remember, your cell has many different membranes. It's got an outer membrane. It's got a nuclear membrane where all your DNA is stored. It's got mitochondrial membranes, which protect the rest of the cell from the, the furnace that is burning all the fat. That's the mitochondria, the powerhouse. Uh, it's got endoplasmic reticulum membranes and all kinds of other membranes in there. And they're all lipid bilayers. And the functionality and the fluidity of them depend entirely, well, not entirely, but greatly on the omega-3, omega-6 ratio. There are biochemical systems in the brain. Uh, the endocannabinoid system is one. Uh, it regulates energy and appetite. There are cosinoids. This is a global way that your body um, takes care of inflammation and regulates inflammation in the body, both inside the cell and outside the cell. There are effects on signal transduction and expression of mRNA. And what does that mean? Well, that means that fish oil it, it actually affects how your genes are read. That we would call epigenetics. It regulates the off-on switches, and it regulates which genes get read and which ones don't get read. So the gene regulatory complexes, and mRNA, which eventually goes on to make proteins, and the actual signaling that governs all these things, intimately involved with, with the amount of omega-3 and omega-6. Now, what should you take away from all of that? It's important. Okay, It's important all over the body. It's important at a subcellular level. It's important at a cellular level. It's important at a tissue level, like heart, lung, brain, it's important at a macro level, which is you as an organism, how you function. So now you know why I've been harping on you for the past 12 years about fish oil. Okay. Now, let's uh, jump to the next slide again for those of you who are just joining us. A few of you have just come in recently. Um, once again, it has to do with the September 1 deadline. The test is only going to be able to be done by you in the comfort of your own home without the intervention of a physician until September 1st. You must do it, which should take you all of about five to 10 minutes, and send it in to Brooklyn, uh, which should take you all of about another five to 10 minutes, um, and get it in there by September 1st. Th those of you who are going to want to make some adjustments in your fish oil dose, uh, and we'll go over the testing in a minute, um, you still have enough time. It really won't take more than seven to 10 days of increasing the dose of your fish oil to show up in the test. You will see those results relatively quickly, so you still have time if you want to improve and do a follow-up test before the end of the month. There is enough time. And also, just so you know, Ultra 85 is on sale tonight. It's at conference price, which is the significantly reduced. Uh, I think Patrick sent the link out for that as well to all of you who are on the call. And then finally, we have our YouTube uh, volunteer getting their finger stuck showing you how to do the test. Again, very, very simple. OK, next slide, please. I really want to get to some live questions, too. I'm, I'm dying to talk to you folks. 
Okay, here's one I hear a lot. Well, fish oil goes rancid in your body. It, it's bad for you. And, um, you know, those of you who read some of the, uh, um, shall I just call them more questionably qualified people out there, you'll see this come up again and again. Fish oil goes rancid in your body. There was a question about the rancidity. Um, so let's talk about what rancidity is. Rancidity is actually oxidation, okay? So oxidation is rust, or in the case of the body, it's free radical damage to a product. And for all intents and purposes, it translates into inflammation. So oxidized fish oil in the body could potentially be a problem um, if it's not replaced appropriately. What is the primary driver of inflammation in a human body? Okay, Believe it or not, it's not a lack of vitamin C or selenium or magnesium or one of these other chemicals you hear a lot about. It is strictly, and I'm talking about probably 65 to 75 percent of the inflammation in your body, is mitigated by your dietary intake of omega-6 inflammatory fatty acids. That is uh, what affects the omega-3s. That is what turns on inflammation in your body. That is what causes free radical generation in a global, non-targeted fashion, which is what damages your body, which is what oxidizes these omega-3s. So if there's anything that's making fish oil go rancid in your body, it's omega-6s. You want to stop that? Lower your omega-6s and make sure that you take enough omega-3s to replace the ones that are being oxidized, and you will not have a problem at all with oxidized fish oil in your body or omega-3s. The only way you'll have that problem is, is if you're omega-6 dominant. Some of you are, okay? But please don't fall for uh, the, the nonsense out there that this is some thing that happens because of uh, fish oil being a bad product. Even some of the worst fish oils on the market, um, while they clearly don't hold to the standard that, that ours do, they have to have a minimal food standard. The FDA has is food and drug, okay? And most fish oil is imported as a food stuff. And so it falls under the regulation of the food aspect of the FDA. And there is a minimum standard. Now, it's not the best minimum standard. Um, it's, um, we use a GOAD standard, which is 5 milliequivalents per uh, liter, I think, which is almost immeasurable. But um, I think Consumer Reports did do some testing. They found that as far as rancidity, um, there were some issues with some of the cheaper brands out there. Um, they, they were rancid, and they could pose problems. Um, but if you have a quality fish oil, whether you take mine or some other quality fish oil, uh, if it's a quality fish oil, you will not have this issue unless you're omega-6 dominant. So that's something you need to understand. So much of this boils down to this ratio of omega-3 anti-inflammatory to omega-6 inflammatory. Now, what about the fish mafia? Let's go to that. Um, if you think that there is not an agenda, so Patrick, next slide, please. Uh, if you think there's not an agenda, a couple of years ago, um, the American uh, Association, or maybe it was the North American Association of Obstetrics and Gynecologists, reversed their position on it, said that it is okay to eat fish during pregnancy. And about two months later, it was found out that there was a donation made to their organization by the North American Fishing Association. Uh, and that essentially was pointed out that that's the reason they changed their tune. So if you think money doesn't talk, money does talk. And subsequently, when they were caught red-handed, they reversed it and said, OK, maybe you shouldn't eat fish if you're pregnant. Maybe you should take fish oil because it's safer. So is fish safe? Well, again, depends where you catch it and depends what you call safe. Um, this is a study I just pulled. There are many of these out there. And I'm just going to go down to the very bottom dot there, which is the conclusion. And this is from the Journal of Toxicology and Environmental Health. Uh, and they were looking at alutes. Now, alutes have a pretty high omega-3 level. But what's very, very interesting is they don't live a whole lot longer than the average uh, person. Their, their longevity is about the same as yours and mine, in spite of their omega-3 levels. And um, I'd like to tell you it's because, well, they get mercury and lead. It probably isn't. It's probably because they get gored by narwhals and killer whales. And uh, if you look at what kills the Inuits, primarily it's not heart disease or cancer. It's infections from you know, hooks or uh, trauma that they sustain during their very, very dangerous and active lifestyles. But nonetheless, uh, the conclusion of this study was if one subsistence fisher, somebody who's living on fish, 
from an Aleut village ate one cod meal per week for arsenic. Uh, and what they're saying there is that uh, the arsenic level at one cod per week, one cod meal per week, would be above what the EPA allows. And one meal per day for mercury, in other words, if they're eating fish, one fish meal of cod every day, they would exceed the mercury levels, uh, which would be above what was set out, uh, set by the EPA as adverse. They allow you to have mercury and arsenic even though both are uh, almost unable to be completely removed from the body. Now why do I harp about this in fish oil? And as you'll see, we, we get rid of all this in ours and they don't in these other products. Well, let's face it, most of us are going to need to take a fair amount of fish oil to stay in this good range, this 60 to 70 percent range, which I'm going to get to in just a minute. It takes a fair amount of fish oil. It takes six grams or more a day for some of us, depending on what we eat and depending on how physically active we are. Um, and this means that you're probably going to be taking it for the rest of your life, unless you take the stance, and my next book is going to have some guidelines on this, unless you take the stance that you want to get rid of omega-6 from your diet. Now, it's going to be very hard for you to do that and live in Western society. You're going to essentially have to adapt an alut or uh, coastal Japanese diet, which most Americans aren't going to do. So let's take that as a given and say we're going to be taking a lot of fish oil for the rest of our lives. There is very little long-term chronic data on what a little bit of mercury or a little bit of arsenic or a little bit of cadmium or a little bit of lead can do uh, in terms of diseases and sickness to people. The EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, and other government agencies released a, a study last year that said that 77 percent of human cancers are caused by environmental toxins. They didn't say which ones. Well, I'm here to tell you that mercury, lead, cadmium, arsenic are among the worst. And so they're also among the worst as far as dementia and long-term chronic mental illness is concerned. Um, and we have an aging population. And it's going to get older and older. Uh, whether we do all the right things or not, we're going to slowly increase our lifespan. We're just not going to increase our health span unless we do the right things. And so one of the right things to do to maintain your health span is to avoid all this crap. And that's why it's not in my fish oil. If you want to take another brand, make sure you look at it and see what's in there. And somebody asked, well, what makes mine better? Go to that brand and see where they publish their toxicology data. See where they publish their toxins and their microbiology. And the answer is probably they don't. And that alone will tell you all you need to know about the quality of the brands. So uh, is fish safe? Probably not for long-term high consumption. Certainly not if you're going to use it to reverse your omega-3 levels and bring them up without reducing your omega-6s. And uh, it's just you're going to have to eat a lot of fish and you get a lot of toxins. That's what it boils down to. So in my opinion, fish is not a safe source of omega-3s. Uh, I do occasionally eat it, um, but I also test for mercury and lead and arsenic and all that other stuff in my body and I make sure I don't have any. Uh, but we're talking about maybe one fish meal for me every two weeks at the most. Okay, um, let's go to the next slide. Patrick, if you'll go to, yes, how much do we need? Okay, this is the reason you need to do a test, okay? I can tell you that if you look at the studies that show, uh, you look at populations that have high omega-6s, I'm sorry, excuse me, high omega-3s, they're going to have low omega-6s. That's a biochemical fact. You cannot have them both high. One is up, the other is down. They're always an inverse ratio. So if you've got high omega-3 anti-inflammatory fats, you're going to have low omega-6 inflammatory fats. And if you look at the populations, uh, and there's a book in a shelf behind me, you probably can't see it, but it's, it was written by William Lance, who is the godfather of omega-3, omega-6 biology. And he shows the epidemiologic data on heart disease, Alzheimer's disease, autoimmune diseases, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, postpartum diseases like postpartum depression, developmental diseases in children, including Asperger's and, and autism, and just developmental IQ and hand-eye coordination and attention span in children. Um, let's see what else I mean. Diabetes. I think I mentioned cancer, but I'll say it again because this has been a real flashpoint lately. They have infinitesimally less of these diseases as they age than we do in this Western society. And when you figure out the variable, and you figure out sex and smoking and alcohol and all the other variables, and you take them into account, the single most dramatic and isolated variable that means something is the omega-3 to omega-6 ratio. Now, recently we've also found that omega-3s are 
preserving of telomere length. Someone asked the question about, should I take TA65 or should I take fish oil? Uh, I may address that again a little bit later, but the answer, the real answer is both because they work very, very differently. Fish oil does not turn on telomerase to a degree that would extend your telomeres. What it does is it reduces inflammation, and the telomeres are extremely inflammation sensitive, and so it stops that. It reverses that loss of telomere, but it doesn't add telomere length. So if you can afford to do both, you should do both. Somebody else asked me what would be the single most isolated thing I would do. Uh, I'll give you the same answer I gave at David Wolf's conference. Of all the things that I could do for myself, for my own health, if I was stripped of everything and told to do only one thing, it would be to meditate. If I was allowed to take only one supplement, it would be for sure. So I hope that answers those questions. Let's go to the next uh, slide because I want to show you when I say infinitesimally small, what that really means. This is a, a chance for us to actually go through some levels, so I'm going to uh, grab a whole stack of tests that we did on some of you who are on this call recently, and we'll go through them. But I want you to pay real attention to this slide. Americans have high omega-6, okay, and an omega-3 deficit. If you look at the top right-hand slide, that shows the high omega-6 level. Um, if you go all the way to the bottom and where it's pink, it says high percentage of omega-6 in HUFA. That's just uh, highly unsaturated fatty acids. It doesn't mean much. It means an omega-3 deficit. So once again, high 6s, low 3s. Everything in the pink there, 60, 70, 80, means that you are deficient in omega-3s and high in omega-6s. And the populations that are representative of that at the top right there is the good old US of A, very, very high in omega-6s, very deficient in omega-3s. Now. Quebec Urban is at the bottom of that. If you see USA, then it goes Quebec Urban, if you're going down the line. And Quebec Urban, basically this is uh, showing you that Canadians are a little bit better off. Urban Canadians are a little bit better off because they probably have a little bit more fish oil or fish intake. The next on the line is the uh, Quebec Cree, and they chose the Cree because they still have some free-range beef and hunting out there, and they actually have a better level based on, on their eating habits. Further down the curve, and now getting over to the blue side, or on the left-hand side of the big black line that goes through the center there, is the Quebec Inuit. These are transplanted Inuits uh, who, uh, in their natural environment, would have a very high omega-3 level, have uh, still a very high omega-3 level, just not as high as they normally would be. And now you're tending over to the blue side, where you see uh, 40, 30, and the 20 is a little bit blocked out. Primary prevention happens here. If you go down to the end of the curve there for Japan and Greenland, and those are Greenland Inuit, by the way, what you see is that the Japanese have 40% omega-6s, which means they have 60% omega-3s, and they are also among the longest-lived people. They have a, a slightly more placid and less traumatic lifestyle than the Greenlanders do, uh, and that is probably why they're longer-lived. The Greenland uh, Inuits have almost no heart disease, almost no pres breast cancer, prostate cancer, arthritis, et cetera, et cetera and they tend to die of trauma or infections related from, to trauma. Uh, none of that has anything to do with the omega-3s, by the way. It has just to do with their lifestyle. So when you hear about the Japanese and Japanese Okinawans living so long, now you know why, because it's a combination of lifestyle, um, relatively risk-averse, although fishing can be potentially dangerous. They've been doing this for centuries, and they have it wired pretty well. And they have very high omega-3s. They get a lot of seaweed, which is a good source of short-chain omega-3s, and while the short-chain from things like flax and seaweed, et cetera, are not particularly well converted, if it's a major part of your diet, it's driving your uh, omega-3 levels. And of course, they eat tons of fish. Next slide, please. Oh, you know what, Patrick, let's stay on this slide. Let's go through the blood test levels. I'm going to just announce people's names. Uh, I'm not going to give the full name. I'm going to give your first name and your last initial. And then I'm going to tell you where you stand on this chart where the values are, and what you could do to remediate. Now, let me say up front, when I say remediate, that means fix. Um, the first and foremost thing you can always do is lower your omega-6 intake. How do you do that? You eat less processed foods, and you get rid of omega-6 rich foods like avocados and most nuts, with the exception of potentially walnuts. Uh, you also get rid of leg legume butters and seed butters. Uh, most of these are omega-6 rich. Now, some of you are going to ask about hemp and chia. 
those are omega-3 rich, but they're short chain and they're poorly converted. So as a way of raising your omega-3s, they are pretty ineffective. Okay, let's get to the first person here. This is um, Carol A. And I think, Carol, you might have asked about this, and I apologize uh, that, that this didn't get sent to you. But your omega-3, Carol A, is 21%, and your omega-6 is 79%. So if you go to this slide and you go to where it says 80 and you go straight up from the 80 and you see all those black dots there with the USA, that's you, okay? And that means you have some work to do. Um, you're a person who would probably benefit from about six ultra 85s a day and some reduction in your omega-6. So if you're a peanut butter eater, get rid of that. If you're a nut eater, get rid of those. If you're an avocado eater, get rid of that. Those three things alone would go, and of course processed food, so those four things alone would make a huge difference, and then you could easily get yourself into a good level um, by increasing uh, your omega-3s with the ultra-85. Um, I'd say six a day for you would do the trick. Um, next is uh, Jill B. Um, Jill, your level, 23% omega-3, 77% omega-6. You're pretty much in the same boat. Um, you're in that USA. Uh, urban Quebec area, you need to do some work uh, in limiting your omega-6s and increasing your omega-3s. Um, again, you're a person who six ultra 85 a day would, would do the trick. Um, Ms. Nancy B, um, Nancy, uh, you're 30 percent omega-3, 70 percent, so you're a little bit better. You're down at, if you go up from the 70 number, that puts you right around the, the uh, bottom there of the uh, Quebec urban, but you're still nowhere near where we'd like you to be. We would certainly like you to be uh, the, uh, on the left of that big black line that's in the center, which is at just about 50 or 48 percent. So you're 30 and 70. We'd like to see you exactly the opposite. We'd like to see you 70 omega-3 and 30 omega-6. Next we come to a doctor, Dr. David B. Uh, Dr. David B., you're 57 percent omega-3 and 43% omega-6, you're pretty good. You're really, really getting there. Um, you know, maybe one capsule a day extra or just reduce your omega-6s and you're golden. Uh, you'll be in the primary prevention area, so good for you, Doc. Uh, Mrs. KC, uh, K first name, C is the initial of the last uh, name. Uh, you are at 3070, so you're in the same boat as the young lady uh, before, uh, that puts you at Quebec Urban. Again, six omega-3, ultra-85 a day, uh, and reduce your omega-6s. Repeat your test in two to three weeks, and you'll see that you're back in a good range, in that primary prevention range. And by the way, if you actually do the math on this, you'll see that these populations have one-tenth the heart disease that we do in the U.S. Now, why do we harp on heart disease? Because it's the number one killer in the United States and Europe and England, and it's a dietary problem. Heart disease is caused by two things, inflammation, which is caused by excess omega-6s, and bolus feeding, which is what causes the insulin boluses. So we eat too much at one sitting, and we eat too much with omega-6s. You want to fix heart disease? Fix those two problems, or at least fix the omega-6, omega-3 ratio, and you will not have nearly the heart disease that you would otherwise. Marilyn D, 39% uh, omega-3, 61% omega-6s. 39% 61 puts you in line with the uh, Quebec Cree. So uh, you're a person who like two to three uh, ultra 85 a day would do the trick for. And again, as always, anything you can do to reduce your omega-6s. Now, I had a long discussion with, with Dr. Lanz a few months ago, and he was very adamant. He's like, you know, where we fail as clinicians and doctors is we don't tell people to reduce their omega-6s. I have friends in Japan, this is his exact words, that are in the 60% range of omega-3s and they don't take any supplements. Um, and so I asked him if he takes supplements, and I'll let you guess what his answer was. It's very, very hard to do this dietarily. Okay, it can be done. I will tell you to do it, but I would be accused by Dr. Lanz, I'm sure, of just paying lip service to this because the truth of the matter is I'm a function guy. I want to see the result. I don't care how you get there as long as it's safe and healthy for you. And it's much easier to do this with omega-3 supplementation than it is with omega-6 reduction. That said, if you're determined to do it, you can do it. And the next two books I have will have some guidelines for you on that. Stacy H. Hi, Stacy, if you're on the call. St 
Stacy was a wonderful volunteer for me at David Wolf's conference a while back. 40% omega-3, 60%. That's a heck of a lot better than you used to be, Stace, but it still needs some work. You are in the Quebec Cree area. I would say two to three fish oil a day, and again, reduce your omega-6s. Um, now, Susie H. and her husband, Richard H., uh, we've covered their values before, so I'll just briefly go over them if you're on the call. 45% for you, Susie, omega-3. 55%. Uh, so you're getting close. You're getting close. It needs a little bit of work, maybe one or two extra fish oil a day and some remediation, reduced nuts. Um, hubby Richard, 36% uh, omega-3, 64%. So you need a little bit more work than your wife, so help each other. Uh, next is Ms. Fumi, uh, last initial J. Uh, Fumi, 49% uh, 51. So you're right now on that black line there where you're going to start to see, and I should point out if you're staring at this line, notice that even a little bit of improvement reduces your risk of uh, coronary heart disease mortality. A little bit goes a long way, but I want you to be the best. I want you to be in blue. I want you to have one-tenth the risk, statistically speaking, as the average American does. So Fumi, just a little bit more work here and you're there. You need to get a little bit further to the left of that center black line that uh, goes through the Quebec Cree and Quebec Inuit. Ms. Cheryl L, 42%, 58%, again, uh, sort of in that Cree Inuit area. Now, what's exciting to me about all this is a year ago when I had this telecom, everybody was 22% omega-3s and 80% omega-6s. So it is getting out there. You people are listening. You are doing something. You are learning. You're taking action that will help your health. And that's very exciting to me because I was beginning to believe that the whole world was just going to run around in a massively inflamed state. And it was kind of bumming me out because if we fix this, we fix a lot of problems. Mr. Peter M., my friend Peter, 52% uh, omega-3, 48% omega-6. Getting there, my friend, getting there. Very close. Again, one or two extra a day, a little bit of remediation on the omega-6s, and you'll be just as good as the Japanese and the Greenland Inuits. Mr. Charles O., again, good friend from Dr. Dave's best. 48.52 as well. You're in the same boat. Uh, minor tweaking is necessary. Mrs. Mary P., absolutely the same, 42.58, minor tweaking. So a lot of improvements in you folks. Joe R., and we're getting down to the end of it now, so bear with me. Joe R., you're 51 and 49. You're right on that line. Again, very close. This is, again, tremendous. 22% was what we used to get, 22, and I was excited when I saw somebody who was 30. Now we got guys in 40 and gals in 50. This is great stuff. Mr. John S., 42, 58, same thing. Very close to being into the primary prevention range. Mr. Eli S., 37%, um, 63. Eli, you do have some work to do. You're uh, kind of up in that Quebec urban range. So you're talking about three to four ultra 85 a day extra. Dr. Richard S., another doctor, 56%, 44. I'm so gratified that the doctors are doing well. Um, we just got a result back on an official guru. Some of you would know him if I named him. I won't name him. He's been official guru for many years. Uh, he's written several books uh, about how to maintain a, a specific uh, range. Um, and his, uh, he's 50-50, so he's not even quite where, where some of you folks are. So you're doing better than the gurus in some cases. Uh, Mrs. Martha S. Martha. 36%, 64, three to four fish oil extra a day for the next two to three weeks. Uh, get rid of those nuts, lady, if you can, and uh, you'll be in better shape. Lori W., Lori W., 16%, 84. Oh, my gosh, Lori. If there were a prize for the worst omega-3 level, it would be you. God bless you. You're at the top right hand there. You're smack dab with the most other people in the United States. And I'm going to guess that if you're taking anything, uh, it's not mine, and it's not regularly. Uh, you definitely need six ultra 85 a day, and uh, watch your diet more closely, I think, because uh, you're clearly running around in an inflamed state. Mrs. Kimberly W., Ms. Kimberly W., 48.52, again, very close to the center line, getting better. Beverly W., now I know Beverly well enough to know that she's always going to have a good number she had last time, and her number, 52.48, uh, again, very close to being acceptable. So just squeeze it a little more, one more for sure a day. Mr. Paul W., uh, coming to us by way of Ms. Kristen W. Uh, Paul, 41% omega-3s, 
uh, omega-6, 59%. That's kind of in the middle. That's not as bad as we might have thought, uh, given what, what your significant other told me about your eating habits. But uh, you're getting there. Um, again, maybe two more fish oil a day and you're golden. And uh, Mrs. C.W., uh, 80% omega-3. You take the cake for the highest omega-3 level. You're never going to die of heart disease. <laughs> okay. Next slide, please, Patrick. And thank you all for bearing with me on that one. I know that was a long, uh, but I wanted to make sure that everybody who did the test got their value. This slide simply shows you that omega-6 displaces omega-3s. What do you need to know? They're always inverse. When your omega-3s go up, as in when you take more fish oil, you will automatically lower your omega-6s. Why would you want to do this? Next slide, please. And this slide will explain to you why I make and use and take and give ethyl esters to my patients, my family, and my clients. This is a GC Prevenzioni trial. This is a big, big Italian trial done in a country where they had socialized medicine so they could randomize people. Um, and in addition, I should comment that even though it was a big trial and it was at least partially funded by the pharmaceutical industry, they stood to gain nothing by doing this in Italy because Italy has pretty cheap prices on drugs. You may not know this, but the United States sponsors essentially the, the drug use of the rest of the, of the world. If you look at a drug like Crestor or Lipitor or one of the statin drugs, they're $130, $150, and that's what your insurance is paying also. In Mexico, they're 5 or $10. In Canada, they're 50 and over in Europe, they're probably in the 30 to 50 range. So the, the cost of the drug is based strictly on what the perceived uh, ability of the person in those countries to pay for it. If they charged people in Mexico $130 for Lipitor, nobody would take it. So guess what? That means you and I can pay for that out of our insurance premium. So when this study was done, um, in a country where the, we're not going to make a lot of money selling drugs, um, I looked twice because it really mitigates to some degree the, the study bias. Uh, this was a well-organized multi-center trial. This particular study had over 15,000 people in it, and the GCs overall had over 100,000 people when you look at their aggregate data. They used an ethyl ester fish oil, and they, they looked at people who already had a heart attack, and they looked at what happened three and a half years later. There was a 21% reduction in all-cause deaths. So this is crazy, isn't it? it? It caused less homicides, less suicide, less motor vehicle accidents, less falls, less pulmonary emboli, less cancer deaths, less everything. And specifically in the stratification of cardiovascular disease, the first one there, CV death, that's cerebrovascular or stroke. For those of you who wonder, does it, does it do anything for stroke? 30% reduction in stroke in this, in this study. Cardiac death, 35% reduction in cardiac deaths. Uh, CHD is congestive heart disease death. Congestive heart failure, 32% reduction. And this is the first time anybody looked at congestive heart failure, which is a totally different disease in most cases than ischemic heart disease or heart attack, and found the relationship between omega-3s and CHF. And that could be a whole other lecture in itself, but I won't do that tonight. Sudden death, mostly from cardiac causes, 45% reduction in sudden death. That's when they decided, gee, maybe we better start studying fish oil in arrhythmias. And then finally, 9% reduction in second um, myocardial infarctions. Next slide, please. I talked to you about the differences, the biochemical differences between fish oils. Now I want to show you what this means where the rubber meets the road. Here is a curl result. Some of you have seen this. I show this often when I'm speaking publicly. This curl came from uh, probably the most famous curl marketer out there who doesn't like me because we had an argument in 2009 at the Manhattan Beach Conference, <clears throat> and apparently he didn't like the way the argument uh, turned out. And so he began an anti-fish oil campaign. So I just surreptitiously bought some of his krill and sent it off. And what you see here, if you look under additional testing, you see th something called dioxins and furans, and there's a whole list of them there. And what you see is a less than sign in front of my stuff, which is in yellow, and some measurable amounts there, and particularly some of the furans, which are pesticides and petroleum and plastic, mostly plastically, uh, plastic derivatives. You can't escape the, the, the plastic love affair in the society and it shows up in krill. Why? Because krill is harvested from the ocean, the ocean is dirty, and nothing is done to purify it. They will tell you it's a small, tiny little thing, it's high in the food chain or low in the food chain, depending on how you look at it. It cannot accumulate a lot of toxins. That's true for one krill. 
if you take 100,000 or 100 million krill and you make a bottle of krill oil out of them, you are going to magnify that, and that's exactly what you see here. I would call your attention to something called PCBs. It's kind of in the middle of the page there. 49.1 parts per million of these. These are polychlorinated biphenyls. This is a plastics derivative. Then you've got your metals. Mercury, not so much, but it's measurable. Arsenic, 5.47 uh, parts per million is 50 times the amount the EPA allows in drinking water. Okay, That's in krill. And this guy will smile at you and tell you that it's pure. Next slide, please. Would you give that to your mother? Would you give that to your kids? Are you taking that yourself? You know. OK, we did some shelf, off-the-shelf uh, stuff. We, we pulled uh, a store-bought pharmaceutical grade uh, fish oil from GNC and a natural triglyceride, one of the most famous natural triglycerides lying caught off the coast of the golden coast of Alaska. And we ran them. And um, the brand two, which um, is a pharmaceutical grade, and you have to understand pharmaceutical grade simply means that what they say in the label in terms of EPA and DHA is on there. It has no implications in terms of cleanliness or toxicity or purity, none whatsoever. And when you go down, it, it's not so bad. There's a few things in there. There's a few things missing. But there are some pollutants. There are some toxins. Again, polychlorinated biphenyls, you can't escape that in the ocean. And then you have measurable amounts of mercury, arsenic, and cadmium. There's a telomere shortener for you. Um, and let's move all the way over to brand three, the triglyceride. Again, this reflects the ocean it was caught in. Not so bad, except when you get, to, uh, again, uh, it looks like the it is the arsenic. I'm sorry, it's the, uh, the mercury level here is 33 parts per million. So you're not going to escape toxicity unless you clean the product up. Next slide, please. And then we're getting close to the, uh, the end here. And we can go ahead and I'd love to talk to you folks live if you still have the energy. Now, somebody asked me about prostate cancer. Um, this was an awful study. And it, it, it was done strictly for grandstanding. Um, it was done to get attention. I am sure the people who published it have a vendetta against supplements because the, the guy, Brasky, the lead article guy, said, once again, we have proven that supplements are dangerous. This was the conclusion he, he drew. Now, that implies that he proved it before. Um, he didn't. Actually, the other study he did on trying to prove this came up a failure. What he's referring to here is that the data for this prostate cancer analysis that he did came from a much bigger trial called the SELECT trial. And that trial came to the conclusion that vitamin E alone as a supplement might increase prostate cancer. When you combine it with selenium, that all goes away. And nobody really knew what the heck to do with that trial. Um, and it was, of course, funded by pharmaceutically based uh, grants. I don't know who funded this. I'm suspicious. But uh, I've gone through this so many times on my blog. I'm not going to beat it to death. It was a very poorly done study. The people that were studied were already inflamed. Some of them were smokers, obese, and hypertensive, all of which are risk factors for prostate cancer. They did one, one value, and they found essentially 22% across the board. The variation between cancer, non-cancer, aggressive cancer, and non-aggressive cancer was 0.2%. So that would be like me telling you you're 48.2% versus 51.7%. Uh, you know, they're calling that statistically significant. There's a bunch of other stuff to go into, but this is just the worst kind of study. And it got a lot of airplay because it said something different than what we know to be fact and true. And in the science world, generally speaking, even if this were a valid study, which it isn't, um, you would want to go back and look at the data and see what the weight of all the other studies show, which the weight of all the other studies show that fish oil and omega-3s are preventative for prostate cancer. Uh, the other piece of advice Dr. Brasky said was eat more whole grain and nuts and get more omega-6s. That will give you cancer. Um, and I'm not a vindictive person, but I often wonder if Dr. Brasky is following his own advice. Let's hope so. Let's have the next slide, please. OK. How do myths get started? Myths get started by a combination of advertising and bad science. Uh, we live in a world that doesn't have time to read anymore. We live in a world that doesn't have time to listen anymore. Um, how many times have you gone into a store and told somebody something and specifically said, no, I don't want this? 
and they repeat it back to you, and they say, well, you want this, right? And it's like, why did you even say it? They didn't even hear it. Their brain is not listening. This is our society right now. We're sound bites, and we're texting, and we're this, and we're that. We don't listen, we don't digest, and we don't think. We want everything spoon-fed. And so when an Internet headline comes up, we take it at face value. First, krill is 40 times more potent than fish oil. This is still out there, okay? This was originally started by Schiff with Mega Red. What they did was they did a study, uh, a small study, and they compared krill to cod liver oil, which is a natural triglyceride oil. If I were going to try to prove that my omega-3 product were better than something fish oil-based, I would use the worst fish oil I could find, the weakest fish oil I could find, and the dirtiest fish oil I could find, and that would be a natural triglyceride product. And that's what they did. And they found that one value, known as the CRP, was significantly lowered more by krill than it was by this lousy fish oil. And so they said it's 40 times more potent at preventing heart disease. Now, they were immediately taken to task by the Ad Council and said, remove this. This is false advertising. It's not accurate. First of all, CRP is by far a, a peripheral marker of heart disease, if anything. It only means something in the context of already diagnosed heart disease. And you have no clinical studies looking at outcomes, so you can't say this. So they pulled the ad. However, some guy out there most recently, within the past week, Dr. Krill, is persisting in saying this. So uh, this is how things get started. People don't pay attention to the field. They don't do the research, and they don't care what they tell you. Uh, I will always keep you updated as best I possibly can. This is my living. This is what I love. This is what I do. I don't want anybody to know more about this than I do. And, you know, if anybody comes up and starts giving me a raffle, you know what, I want to be able to shut them down really quickly. And that's the way it's always been for the past 12 years. So, yes, I've spoken with the experts uh, in this field, the basic science researchers who started this field. I know where the holes are. I know where the gaps are. And this is a classic example. Fish oil, no good for. Insert anything. Alzheimer's, hypertension, heart disease, whatever. Okay, Alzheimer's. Last year, fish oil no good for Alzheimer's. They used a low dose of DHA. They did not check levels, and they assumed that, uh, it, therefore, it was no good. Remember, fish oil is EPA and DHA. EPA does contribute to the level of DHA in the brain, even though these researchers didn't seem to know that. Hypertension. Fish oil may be bad for hypertension. Don't take fish oil if you have high blood pressure. Consult your doctor. Your doctor doesn't know about this. I'm sorry. He's too busy or she's too busy trying to keep you from dying, okay? Hypertension. This study was a mouse study. It used DHA only, and this is where the myth of the short chain uh, um, non-natural ethyl ester started. They used an ethyl ester DHA, and they found that it might block the mouse's uh, calcium channels and worsen hypertension. Mice are, are herbivores. Their fatty acid biology is 100% different than human beings. This has been outlined in the past. These researchers either didn't know that, which is what I suspect, or didn't care to address it. This data is out there. People who are doing research in, in supplements should know supplements, okay? You shouldn't get a plumber to fix your car. You shouldn't get a hairdresser to paint your house unless they have that skill. You shouldn't do a research on supplements unless you understand fully the human, human biochemistry of that and the outcomes, not just the fact that there's a biochemical pathway that exists in the body. What does that mean in human beings? Does it mean anything? Heart disease, okay, this was last year. Fish oil no good for heart disease. So they took people who were had diagnosed heart disease for 10 years, were on maximal therapy with drugs, four drugs or more, and they put a gram of fish oil, uh, actually it was a half a gram when you actually looked at what they put in, but it was one gram of uh, total fish oil, half a gram of EPA, DHA, in margarine, made them eat the margarine on their bread and butter or whatever it was they were making, and it didn't, didn't prevent the progression of heart disease. Okay, I'll let you draw that conclusion. And finally, the Lantus insulin study last year, or this year, early. Lantus is a long-acting insulin. They were trying to show that it improved the outcome of heart disease. It did not. It failed miserably. And they did a subgroup analysis on Lantus and fish oil. Uh, same situation, essentially low-dose fish oil, no levels. Nobody bothered to check what, what these people were taking or whether they were compliant. Same thing with the prostate cancer study. Nobody checked to see if they stayed on the fish oil or not. And what they did was they released this thing that for sure was no good for heart disease. And then two weeks later, when everybody was still busy looking at that, they released the failure of a Lantus study. So uh, obfuscation, I believe, is the word. You're, you're blowing smoke. And then, of course, we talked about prostate cancer and the conclusions that Dr. Brasty came up with 
which were eat more omega-6s and supplements were dangerous. Neither of those were actually looked at in the study. Next slide, please, Patrick. And again, I apologize. We are getting down to the end here. I want to give you the truth here, folks. I want you to, to get the deal. Brian Peskin, okay? Somebody always asks me about Brian Peskin, okay? Now, Brian Peskin is not a professor of anything. I think he might have a master's degree in electrical engineering. He claims he has a PhD. Uh, you can go to this link and, and see what Quackwatch said to him. But again, there's deceived and deluded. Most people will look at this and say, oh, this guy is probably not real trustworthy. He's a very big anti-fish oil guy. There are a few people out there that say, yeah, but that's Quackwatch, and they work for the government, so I think uh, he's OK. You've got to believe what you've got to believe. But going to jail, tax evasion, fraudulent claims, these are not good things for a supplement designer or for anybody. And if somehow you believe that this guy is, is on your side, well, I can't help you. But just go to the link and read it and see what you think. And uh, um, stop asking me about Brian Peskin, please. Next slide. Okay, once again, September 1st, last chance for the test. There it is. It's discounted. It's 99 bucks. Normally sold for 139 So there's last 25 tests. Got to go. YouTube link to see how to do it. And we we're also selling Ultra 85 at a significant discount. Okay, last slide, please. I, I would like to get to the questions. So Patrick, um, Instead of me going down the list of questions, which I do have, let's open it up. Let's talk to the folks and see what's on their mind. And then if it dries up or it gets quiet, I'll just go down the line of all the questions. Sound like a plan? Uh, yeah, sure. Let's see if we can get a couple of people. So there's already a couple that have actually been submitted to me from the question box, which should be in the lower right-hand corner if you're connected to a, a computer and watching this presentation. Uh, I'm going to shoot a couple of them over to Dave just so we can read over them quickly, and we'll see if we can't get some answers. Okay. While Patrick's doing that, let me let me actually go ahead and and uh, pull up the uh, spreadsheet here, get to some of the questions. Um, other than fish oil, can you suggest some good sources of omega-3 products to purchase that you would take yourself? Well, <laughs> no. <laughs> I can't because, I mean, I've been on fish oil for 12 years now. I don't see anything better, and I can't imagine. But if you're allergic to fish uh, or if you have some sensitivity to fish oil for some reason that you can't take, uh, we do make a product called Cardio Boost, which is loaded with um, short chain or 18 carbon, the same type of things that you would find in flax and chia. If you're a vegan vegetarian and are absolutely abjectly opposed to supplementing with fish oil or eating fish, you know the dangers of fish exist in pollution. But if you're abjectly uh, against that, then what I gave uh, at David Wolf's seminar was uh, get rid of the omega-6s. That means no more almonds, especially because there's 6,000 uh, milligrams of omega-6s to something like 100 milligrams of omega-3s per serving. No more avocados, no processed food, and uh, at least four to five ounces of flax oil. Flax is the most concentrated. If you want to use chia or hemp, Keep in mind that you are also going to be getting some omega-6s with that. Um, somebody asked me, what is the other 8% of your 92% fish oil? Um, I'll answer that one briefly. Uh, very, very small amount of omega-6s. All, all fish oil actually has some omega-6s. Uh, but about 2% of the 92% of the, the rest of the 8% is, is omega-6s. And the rest of the um, other 6% is a combination of shorter chain fats that are naturally found in fish, those tiny little bumps I showed you on the mass spec, uh, some uh, tocotrienols, which we use as a uh, um, uh, antioxidant, uh, which is from aneto oil. Um, and uh, that's pretty much it. That accounts for the, the rest of the 8%. So uh, in our product line, Cardio Boost would be a good source of uh, non-long chain fatty acids. Flax, uh, in, in this order, flax, oil, not seeds, but oil mostly. Uh, seeds have it, but then you're getting a lot of other stuff that you're going to have to gobble hands full. Um, chia and hemp in that order because they are um, containing also um, sixes and nines. Now, in an inflamed society that's trying to balance its 
threes. You don't need any more sixes. Okay, so I will I will name something. There's a guy out there named Udo Erasmus, and Udo has what he calls a balanced oil. It's three, six, and nine. And I've never been able to get an answer to this question from Udo. Udo, why would you take a population of people that has 22% omega-3s and 78% omega-6s and give them more omega-6s? And why would you give them omega-9 when they can synthesize omega-9? And it's not, it's not an essential oil. They can make it. And I, the only answer I can get is, is maybe Udo is a very hardcore paleo guy, and if you're if you're really into paleo and you are either Inuit or Aleut or super paleo and you're monitoring your levels, then maybe, maybe there's some logic for that, but I, I just can't imagine that there's any logic for that, frankly. Um, so that's my answer to that question of, of three, sixes, and nines. And okay, um, let's see. Let me see if there's anything new. All right. I should mention that this is a, pri a, uh, a recorded um, session, just so you guys know. And if you miss parts, it'll be available. And um, I am not seeing any of the questions that uh, Patrick sent. However, we have a ton of uh, other questions. Okay, wait a minute. Yep, here it is. I'm sorry. I do have, we do have, ooh, look at all these. My goodness. Question about ultra 85. Uh, is it safe to take during pregnancy? Um, absolutely. Absolutely. And your child will thank you for that. Uh, what is the relationship between low blood platelet count and omega? Uh, it's hard, it's hard to, to read these because they're coming up only one line at a question at a time. Uh, what is the relationship between platelet count and omega-3s? Um, the only thing that I can think of is if you have a low platelet count, that there's some other issue. Now, how low is low? Uh, you know, if you're 5% below normal, you might just be an outlier. If you're significantly low, like if you have a platelet count of 50,000 or something like that, you've got a disease. You've got some problem going on there that needs to be addressed. Um, you could potentially run into a problem with high dose omega threes if you have low platelets, because your platelets are part of your clotting mechanism, and there is some platelet inhibition through omega threes. So if you had a very low platelet count, um, and I haven't seen this clinically, and it hasn't been an issue in terms of surgery, somebody asked about surgery and omega threes. Stop them a week before, and you'll be fine. But there's a study on one of the bloodiest surgeries out there: cardiothoracic surgery, heart bypass and omega-3s that had to be done more or less emergently, and it, the omega-3s did not cause any increase in bleeding problem. That's as much a reflection, however, of very good blood handling by the cardiothoracic surgeons, but it's good to know. Um, okay, let's see. Um, let's see if I can do that. Okay, is it okay to chew the capsules in oil and not eat the capsules? Sure. Absolutely. Should this be done with a meal? It uh, doesn't much matter. The, the gut is really good at absorbing fat, so it doesn't much matter. Um, since this is a kind of food and you're sort of mimicking uh, that, um, it's, it's, in a perfect world, you would do that with a meal. Um, but it, it, I wouldn't miss a dose because of that. Um, let's see. What else can we get out of this one? Um, okay, we answered that pregnancy question. What's the relationship between platelets? We answered that question. Uh, very low platelet count. Okay, um, my omega-3 test indicates I'm over 50%. Uh, for, for the gentleman or woman who answered asked the question, I would just leave yourself right where you're at with the 50% uh, omega-3s. I don't, your fish oil is not the reason you have a low platelet count, okay? The, there's some other reasons. It is not the fish oil, and uh, 50,000, if that's your platelet count, is still enough to clot in most cases. But um, again, I can't give medical advice. You can discuss it with your with your physician. But generally speaking, I've never seen uh, a person have a low platelet count because of fish oil. Next question, is carnosine good to take with fish oil? Um, sure. Um, it's absorbed very, very well. Again, carnosine is, is uh, 
and your body eventually breaks it down into the two amino acids constituents. It's easy for most people to, to do that, so it doesn't matter if you take it with food or without, but sure you can take it with your fish oil. Should a person with cancer take fish oil? Well, I would. Um, I certainly would. Um, again, you have to discuss this with your oncologist. They're very scared about using any kind of supplements, many of them, and it depends what center you go to. If you go to a very pro progressive nutritionally based center, they'll say absolutely. If you go to a standard traditional oncologist, they'll say absolutely not. So that's one I have to turf, but I can only tell you what I would do it if it was me. Um, steps to longevity about eating meat, free range beef. Yeah, free range beef is a lot better than, than regular beef. Um, are there algal versions of omega-3 reasonable to take? Um, not yet. The DHA content is just uh, too high versus the, um, the EPA. You really do need more EPA than DHA. There is a, uh, a form that's coming out probably in a year or two, algal, with high EPA, uh, higher EPA and a more balanced thing, but just be advised that's going to be GMO'd. Uh, that's not going to be uh, anything natural. They're going to be doing gene splicing in that to get that to happen. And, most of the people who are concerned about eating animal sources are also concerned about GMOs and avoid them like the plague. So there's unfortunately no free lunch. If you want to get algae to do something they don't normally do, which is make lots of EPA, you're going to have to stick genes in there and amplify them, and that's called genetic modification of the organism or GMO. Um, more specific on what kind is the most effective. Um, you know, I'm trying to be unbiased here. I think ethyl ester fish oil is most effective because, number one, it's been clinically tested at a much higher degree than any of the others. Um, there are large epidemiologic studies, however, on people who just eat fish, lots of fish. Now, they're not you and me. These are Aleuts and Japanese. These are people who are getting their huge amounts of omega-3s along with pollutants and toxins. Who knows how much longer they might potentially live if they didn't have to deal with that. Um, based on my reversal of biologic age through TA65 and some other things, I'm planning on being around a long, long time if lightning doesn't strike me or a bus doesn't hit me. And so I think that um, there's going to be some n real good reasons to avoid toxins in the future. Um, you can get enough omega-3s from any of the formats, the phospholipid format, the triglycerides format. You just have to be willing to either allow yourself to get exposure to toxins or gobble up handfuls. Um, you know, if you're taking a 30% uh, triglyceride form fish oil, you're going to have to take 18 a day to, to equate to the um, Ultra 85. What is my opinion of coconut oil? I think coconut oil is all the rage right now. I use it to cook with um, because it has a reasonably high flash point. It is a short-chain fatty acid. It is an omega-6. It's pure omega-6. But again, nothing is as simple as it seems. It's not a long chain omega-6, so the body doesn't process it like it would uh, the omega-6s that you get from processed foods or from nuts or from other sources of the parent oil, linoleic acid. Coconut oil is short chain, and it's a great source of fuel for the mitochondria. It's extremely effective in treating um, early stages of Alzheimer's and early stages of uh, chronic fatigue. Um, but I would be very careful to lateralize its health benefits outside of that. It's now being touted as being good for everything. Where the data exists is small anecdotal studies on Alzheimer's disease, and I've used it in some of my people that have that, and it does work when they're not really bad uh, because it's a preferred fuel for the mitochondria. They don't have to work to create um, energy. And Alzheimer's and chronic fatigue, multiple chemical sensitivities, uh, to some degree post-traumatic stress. These are all mitochondrial illnesses where the mitochondria shut down and uh, you need to nurse them along and coconut oil is a great way to do that. Um, it's not a good way to fix your omega-6 or omega-3 ratio. It has nothing to do with that. It's a decent thing to cook with. Um, that's my opinion on coconut oil until we find out more, hopefully. Olive oil, um, you know, don't cook with it. Um, saute with it because it has a low flash point. It's also got some omega-6s. I think the Mediterranean diet, where, which is where olive oil got very popular, it has much more to do with omega-3s than it does uh, olive oil. Uh, the gel uh, caps derived from fish or beef, they are derived from um, um, beef that is tested for mad cow toxins. Um, 
the, here's the thing. We tried making a veg cap, and it doesn't work. Uh, a vegetarian soft gel is a porous capsule. It allows oxygen in, which is something you don't want because you don't want to get rancid fish oil. Remember that whole story of oxidation. Uh, vegetarian soft gel does not protect the contents. The fats are easily oxidized if they come into contact with oxygen, so you don't want that. You need it to be as airtight as possible. And in addition, um, you just reduce the shelf life to about three or four months when you do that. So it's just not a good situation until they uh, come up with advances in those soft gels. Um, we are going to be using the standard soft gel. Again, some of you don't want to consume that. Bite into the Ultra 85, suck down the oil, and spit out the capsule. It tastes wonderful. It's an amazing taste, and most of you who've tried it will agree with that. Okay. Ultra 85 and uh, Super Omega-3, that's a great question. Uh, Super Omega-3 is a, a concoction. It's about three or four different phytochemicals, including ginger, rosemary, and curcumin. And all of these attack the inflammatory pathways in a little different fashion than omega-3s. So it's a very broad-based uh, anti-inflammatory. It has a 600, 400 EPA DHA capsule in it. It is not Ultra 85. It's a bigger version of our standard uh, fish oil. Ultra 85 is a much newer compound. Super Omega-3 is uh, uh, something with an incredibly long and wonderful track record. Uh, it's particularly good for people who have um, low HDL or uh, who have uh, autoimmune or arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, this kind of thing. Someone asked about bumping up their level uh, by adding Super Omega-3 to Ultra 85. I do that. I think it's a great thing um, because then you get a really broad spectrum anti-inflammatory effect. And if you have wet macular de degeneration, can you take high dose EPA because of the blood thinning? So you're going to have to ask the, uh, that of your um, your uh, ophthalmologist. Uh, unfortunately, uh, there is a lot of data on EPA and DHA uh, reducing the incidence of macular degeneration both wet and dry. Um, but it's reducing the incidence. It's not treating it while you have an active form. So. Uh, I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, uh, it's a good question. I'll try to find that out. But uh, I think your ophthalmologist is probably the best person for you to ask that question of. Um, my guess is you could probably get away with low dose without causing problems, but ask that question. Can kids take Ultra 85? These are the, the reason we made it taste so good is so they can bite into it, spit it out, or you can just spread it on their cereal. It tastes like a, a lemon lime. Um, Here's a, a person who says they've been taking my fish oil for a month and it's lowered their blood pressure from 159, 108 to 120 over 98. Your stuff flat out works. Yeah, it does. Uh, I've got people who don't get migraines anymore, uh, that kind of thing. Should you cycle on and off? Nah, don't cycle on and off something that's good for you. Doesn't the fish get omega-3s from uh, marine sources? Sure, they do. Um, and then they make them into to fish oil. Um, same thing with um, the... Um, free-range beef. It takes plants uh, and algae, and, well, not algae, that's what fish do, but uh, the, let's, let's call grass the, the land-based version of algae, uh, and they, they convert them into long-chain fatty acids for human consumption. So yes, that is true. Uh, I'm not sure if there was another question based on that. Um, audience question, how do I access the Ultra 85? Um, and Patrick, you've answered that. Thank you. Okay, um, can we can we actually open up the lines a little bit? I'd like to see if anybody else has any active questions. Uh, there are a few more I want to go over um, on this, uh, people who had asked questions. So Patrick, uh, is anybody waiting to ask a question? If they want to talk to me directly or just want to chat with the old doc this evening before we shut it down? Uh, so I can't see anyone actively waiting, but if someone would like to talk, if they could just submit yeah. a question saying they'd like to, I could get them on the line with you. OK, super. Let me keep answering some questions then. Um, you know, uh, there's a comment here about the prostate cancer study. Yes, thank you. I'm glad you agree it's nonsensical. Oxidation present in fish oil capsules doesn't matter. I think we've addressed that. Um, here's an interesting one. Understanding that if TA65 for two I, I've been taking TA65 for two years. Uh, it affects the one size uh, or improves the size of telomeres. Is this true? Um, in every case that I've been able to have someone do a test, um, and um, 
yeah, actually go and do the, the test. The test, the only test that's worthwhile doing, unfortunately, is about $800. It's called the uh, life length test. There are other tests out there that use qPCR or flow fish, and these are of marginal use. Uh, they do not measure the critically short telomeres, and they don't measure your biologic age. Um, so there really isn't much use for using those tests except in large population-based studies where you have you know hundreds and th or thousands of people. And lateralizing those types of tests to individual therapies, which is what the companies that are selling them have done, is, in my opinion, uh, misleading, and it's a mistake. Um, however, um, you know, I can tell you that uh, I've seen dramatic reductions in my own percentage of short telomeres. Over, I've been on it for four and a half years. Uh, I've gained or uh, reversed my age by seven, seven years biologically. I've reduced my short telomere percentage by 5%. Uh, my mother has similar values, although her, her median telomere length is shorter because she's 87 and I'm only in my mid-50s. So that's natural, but uh, she's been able to see that reversal. Somebody asked how long she was off TA65 uh, before our, uh, we started it again. She was off it for about six months, um, and she was getting worse and worse and worse. Um, and uh, it was embarrassing you know, that I didn't think of it sooner. I just assumed she always did what I told her to do. <laughs> so uh, there you go. Um, not always the case. So uh, she, I'm happy to say she's back on it. She's been back on it now for almost a better part of a year, and she's doing great. And now she asks me if she's running low, uh, can I buy some more? So um, it's, it's very, very clear um, for her. Uh, we covered the whole different formats. Um, thank you, Norm, for uh, your good wishes here. I'm looking at that. Um, eyesight support. We used to have an eyesight support product. It was called Promac Young Eyes. We had it for four years. It didn't sell worth a darn. It was very expensive to make. It was a great product, but uh, people just weren't interested in it, and so we stopped making it. So sorry about that, but you're stuck with what's on the market now, which eh, I could do better. <laughs> the optimal amount of fish oil to be taken per day, and does it vary for age or weight? Uh, it really doesn't vary that way. It varies more on your diet and how much omega-6 you take. So the, the basis for how much omega-3 you take should be your test. Uh, that's, really, uh, that's really it. Uh, someone in from Australia, can I get it tested? You can get the test, and if you hurry up, you can probably get it back to the U.S. and get it uh, done before uh, September 1. Um, let's see. Let's see what else. Mm, does it dissipate in the body, uh, omega-3? Yeah, it's an essential fatty acid. You have to keep taking it. That's, it's food. I mean, you don't stop eating, so you can't stop eating that. Uh, uh, it's just one of the facts of life. Here's a really interesting question from Montiel Lisi. I don't know if you're on the call or not, but Mont Montiel, he, uh, he or she says, uh, if you take two or three different antioxidants at the same time, wouldn't you just be sharing electrons among them and have no beneficial effect on the body. So let's just talk briefly about antioxidants. Because you know, fish oil has often been put up for an antioxidant claim, and uh, and it's been denied summarily because it has an ORAC value of zero. So what's an ORAC value? Oxygen radical uh, absorptive capacity. And what that is is if you take a compound, or, um, presumably an antioxidant, and you expose it to hydrogen peroxide it should absorb some of that. That's called the ORAC, or the oxygen radical absorptive capacity. Fish oil doesn't do that. It doesn't do that at all. Uh, things like immune boost or cardio boost have a very high ORAC. So they're at the, the sharp end of the stick. That's where you've got free radicals floating around, and you've got this sponge, and it sucks them up. And in that case, if you had two or three different sponges uh, from different compounds that would suck up free radicals, the strongest one would suck up the most free radicals, and the weakest ones would suck up less. They wouldn't pass them around or compete with each other. It would be based on which one had the higher oxygen radical absorptive capacity. So how can we have this compound like fish oil with a zero ORAC that's probably more potent than all those things at reducing inflammation and oxidation? It's because it's global. It's because it hits the inflammatory cascade in the body is 50 or 100 steps long. And you're looking when you look at ORAC, you're looking at the very last Step. What about all those other 50 steps? Well, guess what hits it? Almost every single one of them, fish oil. 
And that's why it's a phenomenal antioxidant with an ORAC of zero. That was an interesting question. OK, um, I'm going to ask answer one more. Uh, let's see, there's somebody who had a service question here about getting RG cell week, uh, weekly and that kind of thing. Um, I, I'm going to try to pull that out and give it to our service people um, so that that gets resolved. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, purification of omega-3s, pharmaceutical, uh, what it means is going through some type of purification to reduce heavy, what, what is the purification process itself? The, the purification process that is used for both of our fish oils um, is called molecular distillation. And what, what it is essentially, it's uh, an electrophoretic process that takes place in a very large column. And the uh, original fish oil, the pharmaceutical grade fish oil that has been my product flagship for 12 years, uh, is run on a smaller column. The Ultra 85 is run on a column that's essentially twice the size and twice the current and pulls out more impurities. As far as temperature is concerned, it's a low temperature process. It takes place at 135 degrees Fahrenheit. The oxidation point for fish oil is 253. So we have plenty of room uh, and we are not introducing any oxidation. I showed you the biochemical similarities between the molecules and I showed you that actually there's less work for the body to convert an ethyl ester into something useful like a resolvent or protecting or a cycloprostane than there is a phospholipid or a triglyceride. And by the way, um, the format that you take has something to do with those balances. But the bottom line is, you know, ultimately you're testing this with the ideal omega test. You're getting a level and you're knowing that it works because it shows up in your blood test. If it didn't work, it wouldn't show up there. That blood test correlates with a 90% accuracy with tissue testing. You see, really what we'd like to know is what's going on inside your tissues, your liver, your heart, your lymphoid system, your bones, et cetera. You can't do that. You can't biopsy people's heart and brains and lungs very readily. But you can do a blood spot. And it just so happens that the test has been engineered to be 95% correlative. So it's extremely accurate. So uh, we maybe have some of those left. We maybe don't. I don't know. I didn't look. Um, but September 1 is the deadline, uh, so get them in before that. And the purification process, I hope I answered your question, it is extremely uh, non-volatile. It does not introduce anything uh, damaging. Body knows what to do with it. And it's also a low carbon footprint for those of you concerned about the environment. All right, um, Patrick, I'm going to ask you if there's any other, oh, good. Rick and Susie are on. Rick and Susie, uh, uh, through? Hi, yeah, can you hear me? Hey, how are you? Good, thanks. Back for more. Yeah, well, you can always pick up new things and maybe miss it the first time and catch new things, which we did. And uh, obviously you know that you're going through a completely different set of slides this time too, so it's, it's, it's new information. So I, I actually have a couple questions. One is with relative to the deadline that you're talking about for being able to just mail in a test, right, and get results. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do we do after that? What exactly is the process? For, well, for example, I, I will yeah. probably, yeah, I mean, um, the Ideal Omega website is actually based in Glasgow. Um, so you can still order tests from Edinburgh or, Edinburgh or Glasgow. You know, it's it's, it's Glasgow, the university is in Edinburgh. Uh, I've been there. I've looked at, <laughs> met with the, uh, or spoken to by phone, the director of the lab. And, and uh, so you can still get the test. It's just you have to go to your local doctor and say, hey, I got this test that I need a prescription uh, from you to do it. And if the physician's willing to cooperate, you'll get your test. Okay, so uh, I, just, I just can't justify selling them anymore, Rick, because uh, I can't be that person. I can't establish through the internet uh, doctor-patient relationship. That's right, right. dangerous for both parties. Way to, way and no, no physician in their right mind would ever think they could yeah. give medical advice over the internet or the phone, the, uh, you know, that way, to, to that sure. degree. But right. you can still get it. Uh, it's just you just have to have a cooperative physician. Right, okay. So probably the best way to do it would be to talk with the physician first and before you go order a box, because mm -hmm. you might end up getting a box that you can't use. Unfortunately, uh, that is a real possibility, and uh, I wish there was something more I could do about that. We, we thought of all kinds that we thought maybe if we imported it into the UK, it would 
and there's no way around this. They're, they're beholden to it. They have to. Uh, uh, it has something to do also with the HIPAA laws. Um, you know, it's, so it's. It, when I heard the reasons and explanations, it sounded like just another excuse to regulate something. But uh, so it's, it's a shame. You know. So what would it look like, for example, if I had the box, the test box, and I went and talked to the physician. And the physician said, "Sure, no problem." Would they write out a prescription for that test, and that would be included with the box when you send it? Right. Okay. Correct. And then they would also get the results. I got. They okay. Would. All right. So the the idea is that the general public, and I mean, I'm, I'm I I don't believe this for one second. So please, you know, don't take this out of context or put words in my mouth. But the I the idea that the government has decided is, is that the general public is too stupid to interpret their own test. Uh -huh. Now, let's face it, number one, you personally probably, I mean, there's a good chance you know more about omega-3s now from listening to the various and sundry teleseminars than your doctor does. That's the first thing. The second thing is, even if you don't, the stuff that comes with the test to help you interpret it is very succinct and very clear and it tells you exactly what you have to do. So. Most doctors, if they agree with it, are, are just going to say, well, it says here you should do this. <laughs> so right. You could have done that yourself yeah. and saved yourself the office visit. Now, most docs aren't going to charge you for this. They're going to just put it in as a regular, you know, blood, when they're doing all your other stuff. So it, it's, it's, it's not like I, I think that a lot of medical costs are going to be driven up, but there's a potential. You know what I mean? That's the one potential thing. Yeah. That's bothersome, and I mean, you've you've already done at least one one of these tests. Um, I think you're pretty familiar with what it means and how to how to address it. But uh, that's the name of the game now: regulate, regulate, regulate. Yeah. Okay. The second second question was uh, there were there were several slides that had references and links and like that. Are we going to get a copy of the presentation so that we can have that reference material? I can. Uh, we have your email address. I can certainly ask Patrick to forward that to you. Okay, that'd be fantastic. Yeah, and I just just by way of knowing, um, uh, most of, uh, and I assume that this year's presentation will be up soon too. But most of the presentations that I did at David Wolf's conference wind up in toto on YouTube within a few months. So I mean, there's probably at least. Um, two and a half, three hours of presentations up there. I mean, they're broken up into short segments. But if you really want to watch, you know, and I talk about uh, omega-3s quite a bit in these presentations. Uh, and I, I show a lot of the same uh, in much more detail, obviously, because I'm there in front of people and I can yeah. discuss those kinds of things. But um, there's a lot of me out there on YouTube. So if you type in uh, David Wolf, Dr. Dave, um, you have to get past the Mercola references, but you'll find me there. Okay. Of course, <laughs> list is bigger than mine. That's why. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it, and uh, it was great to have everybody on the call. Thank you so much. Uh, if there's anybody else who wants to ask Patrick a question, uh, let me stick around for another minute or two. If not, we'll call it. And um, I certainly enjoy this. So give us some feedback if it was helpful, uh, and how I can improve it for you in the future. And I hope I address some of the questions. You will hear these myths over and over and over again because I've been hearing them for 10 years now. So they're not going to go away. Uh, the Brian Peskins of the world are not going to disappear. Um, so we just have to arm ourselves uh, with, with information. And um, you know, if you find something that counteracts what I say, and as long as it's not just some internet blog site, but if you find a reference, a scientific reference that counteracts anything I've told you, by all means, forward it to me because I'm very meticulous about what I say. I don't say a word unless I can point out. I mean, there there's a lot of books that I've read on this. That I don't know if you can see the shelf behind me, but most of those are either telomere or omega-3 books. Um, there's a lot of knowledge that I've acquired over the years, but I, I can't know every single thing. That said, um, there's a lot of people who are talking and saying things without any knowledge base whatsoever or very little. So uh, please educate yourselves. OK. Um, there are a few more questions in the question box. Let me see if I can address those, and then we'll uh, if I can get to those. Um, I don't see them, Patrick, so 
I think we're going to go ahead and let people have the rest of their evenings wherever they are. Um, we've answered quite a few questions. So let me take one more look. Yeah, I think we covered just about everything. Again, there were one or two of you who had some customer service issues. I will try to forward those to our customer service people. Um, somebody asked about RG Cell, wonderful product, and if you want to be on that weekly, uh, we'll, we'll work something out. Oh, here's one. Fish oil upset or aggravate gallstones. Um, no one knows for sure whether that is possible because you know the, one of the risk factors, uh, the old risk factors for for uh, for gallbladder disease are fat, female, and 40. Now, that that isn't just fat as in overweight; that's also fat as in fat consumption. Um, so, if your gallbladder is inflamed by fat consumption, generally speaking a fat will do that. However, the omega-3 fats are so well absorbed and they're anti-inflammatory. So uh, when I, I just got done telling you I, I research everything, um, I'm going to have to research that answer to be sure of that. But I can only tell you in my own clinical experience, I've never seen a gallbladder attack precipitated or worsened by fish oil. And I've seen you know, that the anti-inflammatory aspects can improve low-grade gallbladder disease. That's non-surgical gallbladder disease. Um, but I highly doubt if there's a study out there that would answer that question. And I want to be fair and honest and say that what I just told you is based on experience and not on scientific validation. So um, my guess is no, but uh, I'll, I'll see if I can find that out for you. OK. Um, the testing process in Australia, you're going to have to send it to the uh, the uh, Brooklyn. I mean, you can do it. It's easy to do. You do it at home, but you just send it to Brooklyn. Uh, someone negative things about uh, flax seed lately. I'm wondering if it's from David Wolf. I, I don't know. Um, I'm not really a flax seed expert, except to tell you that it has short chain fatty acids and it's a lousy source of, uh, of active bioactive omega threes. Uh, I believe there was some issue about the seed processing. Um, or some potential pesticide or toxins that the flax could absorb inadvertently, but I, I, that's something you'd have to ask David. Uh, is there something you should not take with Ultra 85? Um, no, not really. Uh, somebody asked if they could take krill and fish oil. Mm, if you really want to do that, you can. I don't see the reason. Uh, benefits of eating meat two times a week instead of raw only vegan diet, uh, primarily for protein. Um, you know, I've been able to study the raw, raw food vegan community a lot more closely than most people, thanks to my association with David. And one of the things that I, I'll tell you is they have an abysmally low omega-3 level. Uh, it, when I say abysmally low, it's about average for the U.S. So here you have a group of people who are really trying to eat healthy. And they do eat healthy, with this one exception. But it puts them at the same risk for cardiac disease based on the omega-3, omega-6 ratios as it as they would be if they were eating McDonald's. And that's hard to imagine, but it's based on the, the uh, food consumption. And a lot of those foods are omega-6 rich, avocados, nuts, some of the staples. You can get free-range beef. Uh, and it's a great source of protein, and it's complete protein. Uh, you know, People talk about different types of complete protein. You try to get it from rice. and try to get it from uh, other plant-based things. Um, it's difficult to, to get complete protein from plants. And again, it depends who you talk to. You get the, if you talk to uh, T. Colin Campbell, the author of the uh, China study, you will uh, get a very different answer. If you talk to Lauren Cordain, you'll get an even different answer. Uh, he'll say eat meat every day, probably. Again, I shouldn't put words in these people's mouths, but that's the impression I get from listening to them. Quick word about the China study. Uh, just be aware of the way that study was done. What they did was they looked at demographically cancer rates based on uh, geographic uh, and demographic data from China. Then they went to different places in China where there were low cancer incidences. And they followed these people to the market for three days and watched what they ate. And that is what they based the China study on. Um, it's really not a very good bit of science. Uh, three days of, of following some of these dietary habits and not figuring in all the other things that they might get in a different environment um, is, is not any way to really, in my opinion, uh, create a diet. 
Um, so just be aware of that, and also be aware that up, up until 1948, when B vitamins became commercially available as, as an oral um, source, uh, it was very, very hard to remain healthy on a vegan vegetarian diet because you would get B vitamin deficient. Um, people say, well, what about the Indians? You know, they're vegan vegetarians. Uh, they eat bugs, and they eat a lot of other things uh, that you and I don't eat that have significant amounts of protein in them. So um, keep that in mind uh, when you make your food choices. Um, someone's asking about affiliate purchases uh, or affiliate, uh, um, and um, complaining about getting stuff into Australia. I'm sorry, Australia is a really tough place. Uh, you guys have a customs Nazis that are constantly holding stuff up. And um, you know, if you can find something uh, that you like that gets into your country more easily, by all means, buy it. Um, I'm perfectly willing to uh, to do my best to provide my Australian customers and friends with supplements and uh, anything that I can. But um, you know, it's not easy, and uh, we're a small company. Maybe you need to go to a real big company that is, that can do international shipping uh, easily. We're working on it though, and we're going to get all this stuff down eventually. So. Okay, um, take your fish oil, avoid your omega-6s, and uh, remember the test is still out there until September 1st, and you could potentially also have your doctor do it for you. Just be prepared to educate them. It's been my pleasure. Thank you so much, all of you, for being here. Uh, if you want to have another one of these soon, let me know. Uh, certainly, you can send in uh, your constructive criti uh, criticisms and suggestions. Uh, we're always willing to listen, and we'll do everything we can possibly do uh, to meet your needs. Thank you again, and uh, see you next time. Good night, everybody.